the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Mark writes, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a leather girdle around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for this day, for the proclamation of John the Baptist who pointed the way toward your son. We thank you for his call to repentance that was taken up by the gift of your son. As he also calls us to repentance, we pray that you would bring us here this day before your word and before your meal, that we might come to it in humility knowing our dependence on you, knowing the gift of uh, the truth and the love that you bring in your Son, bless us now. As we hear your word, we pray that you would bless us to know your good and gracious will towards us. And by your same powerful spirit, give us strength to do your will in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wonder if anybody else uh, reflects back on at times uh, the lessons you learned as you were growing up as a child. Um, I I don't mean the the hard knocks lessons. I mean like the basic lessons. I mean like getting dressed lessons. I mean, you remember being taught by your parents to get dressed. How long did it take you? It took me a while to figure out that if you're going to put your pants on uh, two legs at a time, it's easier to sit down. How long did it take you to figure that out? It, it, yes, it took me a while. Yeah, I, I'm a slow learner, uh, admittedly. Um, what about doing buttons on your shirt? Do you remember being taught that? I mean, I work with occupational therapists up at St. Vincent's, and that's very often, you know, they're teaching a person who's had a stroke to, to do buttons, and, and it's amazing to see the thought process that they take people through. Uh, what about tying your shoes? Anybody remember how you were taught to tie? Before the days of Velcro, okay? <laughs> You know, before that, uh, you remember, the, anybody remember the making the loop and your mom and dad said, around the world and through the tunnel? Hey, anybody remember? That? Well, that's how they taught me, uh, one of the lessons I remember. Does anybody remember mom and dad teaching them to cross the street? You remember that? Okay. Now, if we know anything about crossing the street, there is one rule that if you get, you got crossing the street. What is the one rule mom and dad taught you? What do you need to do when you cross the street? Look both ways. You do that. That way you can see what's coming. You can see what's going. uh, And that's really important to be able to cross the street safely. Well, I'm just kind of reflecting on this whole Advent thing. I mean, it really is an odd time of year. It's, a, it's an odd season of the year because we're always looking at least two ways. We are inherently looking back at the first coming of Christ. That's what Advent means. In the Greek, the word is perusia. It means coming. We're, we are looking that direction. We are looking back to see what it means that uh, Christ came the first time. But we are also looking the other way. We're also looking forward to when he comes again. So Advent is a little bit like crossing the street. We live in the present. We are looking back at the past to see what has come. And we are looking forward to the future to know. And we know what is coming again. 
who is coming again. So I, I wanted to touch on those three directions kind of as an Advent theme, an Advent message, um, focused on the gospel. I mean, you know, it, it, there's usually, an, it, it, on any given Sunday, there's an elephant in the room. By that, I mean, there is typically, we read the gospel lesson, and there's typically at least one question that we ask ourselves. What is the proclamation of John the Baptist? And what would we like to know how to do based on that proclamation? He is saying, what is his proclamation? Prepare the way of the Lord. So the question in our minds might be, or ought to be, what does that mean for us? What, is, is this like road construction that we need to have shovels and axes and picks and, you know, like everybody else in Florida, be about road construction? I mean, that could be one approach. Um, uh, but uh, I think there's something more to that. So what does it mean for us to prepare the way of the Lord? What does it mean when we look back in the past? What does it mean today? And what does it mean for us to move forward as the body of Christ, disciples of Christ, into the future? So, good Trinitarian sermon. We're going to look at three things. Uh, what does it mean to prepare the way of the Lord in the past? Now, I am just here to tell you, um, there is more on my cutting room floor right now than you're getting from the pulpit. This Isaiah text, I mean, I could preach on it all day and all night. I mean, it's just dripping with sermons in it. But uh, we need to know in the past, before Christ came, this was a proclamation of Isaiah. Prepare the way of the Lord. And so how did God's people hear that? And how were they able to do that back then? And then how does that principle come forward to us? So Isaiah, uh, so uh, what it means to prepare the way of the Lord, first of all, uh, it starts with God. Does anybody know? I'll give you 70 points if you can tell me uh, where Israel is at right now when Isaiah is preaching this word of comfort in chapter 40. They are in exile in Babylon. Okay, yeah, I'll give you 70 points there. Uh, I'll give you another 70 points. Trick question. I'll give you another 70 points if you can tell me how long they have been in captivity. 70 years. I mean, that, now, that's a long time. I mean, one generation is like 40 years. They were only in the wilderness 40 years. They have been in captivity for 70 years. Do you think that they are maybe a little hopeless right now? Do you think maybe they are feeling a little bit helpless? So the first thing that, that, that the people of Israel believed back then uh, that we see in that Isaiah lesson is that this preparation for the Lord to come starts with God himself. He comes to them of his own volition. And by the way, that's grace. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. They were uh, paying the price for their sins. If you have ever read the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, I mean, get ready for some warning and some serious judgment because it's there, 39 chapters worth. And then the words of grace. So this preparing the way of the Lord, we're going to see past, present, and future always, always, always starts with God himself. It is his gift to us. We can't prepare ourselves without his help. And he is gracious and merciful. He always comes to the helpless and the hopeless first. So after he comes in grace, uh, then he preaches the truth. Do you hear the truth in Isaiah? Does anybody feel a little grassy right now? Uh, all flesh is what? Grass. I mean, like a flower of the field, you're here today and it's gone tomorrow. Uh, I was reading about when I was doing some research for the sermon, there is this southern wind, this warm wind that, that can blow through Palestine at times. And you can have the greenest, grassiest field. And when that southern, when that breath of the Lord blows over us, you know, you know how long t it takes for a green, grassy, lush field to go to brown? Two days. 48 hours, man. I mean, so there's, so God comes to his people. He preaches the truth about them, but he also comes and presents his love. 
His love that comes through himself revealed in his word. So he comes to the helpless and the hopeless. He preaches truth. He also brings with that truth, brings his love through his word. And then when they are, you know, so Israel is in captivity. God has come to them. grace. How do they prepare the way of the Lord? That's the command to them. I mean, you understand they're in captivity. They're not going to go out and build a highway in the desert physically. So how is it that they are going to fulfill this command of God, except maybe if it's a heart thing? Maybe there's a little bit of Florida in our hearts, and there's always road construction. Anybody been out there on the Florida highways and not ran into construction? Okay, so in our hearts, that's where God is traveling to. That's the paths that need to be made straight. And that is the gift that we have in his word that calls us to see who we are and to see who God is. That's what straightens the path, is the gift of the word tells us who we are, how helpless and hopeless we are, but that we have a God that will not leave us there. We have a God who loves us. Loves us so much. Oh, and the last, you know, guys, in these last days, in, in the days before, uh, God spoke to his prophet, to his people of old by what? The prophets, the ones who came thus and said, thus says the Lord. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by who? By a son. So no longer uh, do we need to wonder about God's will. We have it in the flesh. So it is the gift of love, the gift of truth that we have in Jesus Christ. So we, and, and as we go back to Isaiah, we, we got God coming to the helpless, preaching his truth, preaching his love, and then he invites them to do something. I mean, so the ones who were helpless, the ones who were hopeless, the ones who were separated from God, the ones who were spiritually what? Dead. They have now been made alive and they are invited to participate. Do you, I mean, I know it's a little Christmassy, but yeah, we just want to sing, go tell it on the mountain because that's what he's telling the people to do. I'm coming for you. I'm going to start the preparation. Now participate with me. Get yourself up on a mountain and shout out what God has done for you. Do it in word and in deed. Let that be your proclamation about who I am. I'm going to do the heavy lifting of salvation, and I'm going to invite you along. I'm going to invite you to participate in this mission that I am going on. That's God talking. And you know what that mission of Israel was? It's too small a thing that I'm going to bring back the tribes of Jacob. That's just just the tip of the iceberg, guys. But I am going to give you as what? A light to the nations so that Israel's mission that God's salvation is going to reach to where to Jacksonville to Palestine to no Jerusalem Jerusalem Judea Samaria and where the ends of the earth that's the mission that we are invited to participate in because of the amazing grace of God that's what preparing the way of the Lord looked like before Christ And I'm going to argue that I'm going to kind of put it out there that it's the same now and it's the same in the future. Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews says, chapter 13, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. No, yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same. So we have a, a picture of what preparing the way of the Lord looks like in the past. How about today? Well, same thing. It starts with God. It starts uh, because he has come to us. He has come to his people that are helpless and hopeless. You understand in that gospel lesson, as Jesus comes on the scene and John the Baptist is there, uh, the oppression is from Rome. They are helpless and hopeless under the, under the rule of Rome. But we know because of Jesus' ministry, This is not just about Rome. More importantly, it is about the effects of sin in us. So just in case, you know, we're we're wondering, you know, if God is a patient guy, 
uh, you know, 70 years in captivity in Babylon, when John the Baptist comes along on his merry way, how long has it been since there's been a word from the Lord? Was it like last week or, you know, maybe last month or, you know, maybe God took a year or two off? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. You knew that. Yes, 400 years since the last prophet that said, thus says the Lord. God has been silent. The wages of sin, uh, the people suffering with that, helpless and hopeless. That's how God comes to his people. When we are at our weakest, that's when God comes to us. When we understand our dependence, when we can sense it more than anything, that's when he is ready to come to our hearts. So John the Baptist comes and he is preaching truth. And he is calling the people of Israel uh, to admit that truth, that they are like us in bondage to sin. And he's also calling them to, a, to repentance, but a baptism of repentance. Now, now, this is really unique, I just have to tell you. The Jewish people have a lot of ritual cleansings that they do. I mean, there's purification upon purification with water here, there, and everywhere. But there is only one instance in which a group of people was baptized into the faith. And it's not the, it's not the, uh, heredit, it's not the genetic Jews. Anybody know what group of people gets baptized into the Jewish faith? Gentiles. So for all of Judea and the countryside in Jerusalem to be going out to John the Baptist uh, to accept his baptism means what? That, that John is calling them uh, to put themselves on an even playing field, an even dependence with who? Gentiles. You mean we got, we're like them? We, we have as much need for God? That's what this baptism of John does. It levels the playing field. No, Israel, you do not have a badge that gets you into heaven free but you are called to be the leader of the sinners, the ones, who turn, the ones who need to turn to God. So John the Baptist preaches that truth and, and baptizes people uh, into repentance because of repentance. But there's one coming after him, one who's not just going to baptize with water, the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And we know that is Jesus Christ. And we know that's God's work. You think that the Israelites didn't know the prophecy of Joel? In these last days, I am going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And, and as you say, that's not anything that man can bring forth. That is going to be God's work. So here is John the Baptist equating his cousin Jesus with God. He is the one who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is the one that's going to bring God's judgment. He is going to be the one who brings God's truth. He is going to be the one that brings God's love all in the word made flesh. And so we are invited to participate in that now, today as well. We have this baptism into Christ. And that baptism, let's just say, is a one-time event, but it has daily remembrance. Anybody ever gotten a written prescription from their doctor? You ever read some of, well, the writing that is actually legible. Have you ever seen a doctor? But, but they'll, they'll write out a prescription uh, for a medication. And have you ever seen or heard of the abbreviation QD? It actually is a Latin term. It's, it's quack die. And what it means is once a day. So we have this baptism that has been given to us with a daily prescription. And what does Luther say? Remember your baptism every day. Remember your, uh, remember your dependence upon the living God. Remember that he is the one who brought you through the night. While we slumbered and slept, he did not. While we slumbered and slept, he was giving us the breath, giving us the heartbeat, holding us in his very hand and bringing us to this new day. 
And it's a day as we remember our baptism that we are invited to participate in. He has come to us in grace. We get to come here to hear his word, to receive his forgiveness, and to share that forgiveness with one another. That is our participation today, to share and to forgive as we have been forgiven. So there is our participation in what God is giving us by his grace. And finally, into the future. How, is it, how are we going to uh, prepare the way for the Lord moving forward? Well, because that, number one, once again, starts with God's work. That Jesus is the word made flesh. And, he, and that word is what leads us to repentance. That's what's going to lead us into the future. God doesn't change. We are in the ones who need to change by his work, by the light of his word. I always try to make the clarification about what repentance actually is. And I do that by, by saying what it is not. Repentance is not our work that says, God, look what I did. It's not a badge we hold up before God saying, look what I did. You understand that's works righteousness. Repentance that comes from the word always, always, always points to God and says, God, look what you did. Look what your grace did. Look what your word did. Show the light on my sin. Uh, anybody love the hymn Amazing Grace? I mean, that second stanza just really sticks out at me. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. That, that's, you understand that if we need grace, that there's a reason we need grace. Because we are sinners before a holy God. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And t'was grace my fears relieved. Because that grace comes in the, in the Lord Jesus. As he goes to the cross for us. There is the relief that comes from God in Jesus Christ. He has, been, he has gone to the cross in our place. He has brought that grace, that truth, and that love to us. So Peter tells us, uh, ask the question, what's this going to look like moving forward? Since we know God isn't being slow, he's being patient. He wants people to come to repentance. So Peter asks the question, what are we going to do in the future? What kind of people ought we to be? Knowing the truth of how God has revealed himself in the past and that he's not going to change. How ought we to look? What kind of people ought we be moving into the future? Ones of holy, uh, lives of holiness and godliness. And that just very simply means we are set apart by him. We are given our purpose by him. I mean, there's a lot of places we can, we can look for our purpose in life. There's a lot of mottos going around out there about how we should approach life. Anybody remember the, the motto, Schlitz Beer, back in 1975? Go for the gusto. I looked up that word gusto. It means taste. Do what tastes best to you. Make it about you. And you only go around once, so go for what makes you happy. Well, that's not exactly what God is calling us to do. It is his purpose that is best for us. It, and we see that most clearly in his son. We, so we are uh, called to move forward uh, in his holiness and in godliness, Peter says. Godliness means we look like him. Like, like we're hanging out with Jesus' friends, like we're, we're hanging out with angel tree kids. Well, not, maybe not physically, uh, but we're, you know, people from Angel Tree are going to get this card and, and it's going to say from Shepherd of the Who? What, what? I don't know these people. People at Regent's Park are going to, you know, these seniors who have nobody left. And they get a card. Who the heck are these people? They're not going to know who we are, but they're going to know who we're participating with. They're going to get to see our clothing. When, when, we, when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We get new clothes. And so I'll just say this about our clothing. Uh, clothing. 
I was told by my manager at St. Vincent's that now that I'm a grandfather, I get to tell double dad jokes. So you guys are the beneficiaries here. Uh, so he, here's, here's how I would put the dad joke. What do you call pants that a Christian wears? Partissa pants. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Darren. I got at least what I know. That's not the best dad joke. But that we are called to participate with what God is doing with us by and through his grace. That's our get to in life. That, that is our using the gifts that he has given us, time, talent, and possessions, signs of his gracious love. To be used in his grace that people would see us and I don't know if that baptism means anything. <laughs> Let your light so shine before others that they see your participation, that they see your good works and they know that's not you, but they give glory to the Father in heaven who has called us by baptism to participate in his gracious kingdom. I pray blessings on your ministry, that that baptism we would remember every day, that participation that we are called to every day, may that touch our hearts. May we have eyes of faith and trust to minister to those that God has put in front of us. I pray that for us all, in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to meditate on the word and the will of God.